used the pack and I went on Friday, didn't you? I did. <laughs> they wanted to make sure some information was in there. <laughs> and then it took but me a while. By five. It took me a while to read it, to read through it. So. <laughs> yeah, well, you didn't get a chance to read it again. Yeah. We were waiting for quota information, I think, right? Well, the Friday night paper edition. I thought it was in the Friday morning paper. Maybe it was Saturday morning. I don't know. I, it was in the paper. Yeah, it was in the paper, but I don't think it was till Saturday. Perhaps. Because I, I checked Northern's website two or three times. The pa all the papers, none of the papers. It was fine. Well, are you happy with it? Yeah, I mean, it works good for us. Yeah. We needed a tiny bit higher one, you know. It won't hurt us to have 70% this year so. That's kind of the norm, isn't it? I was going to say, that's the way it's been. Totally yeah. Nice. So. Yeah, that's kind of what we expected. It's kind of, they don't go a whole lot higher than that, do they? They don't go a whole lot higher than that, do they? Not very often. Yeah. Last year, you know, occasionally they'll do 70% this month and then like a 10% in June uh -huh. in the supplemental quota. But, uh, yeah, it seems like. Did they do that last year when it was so wet? They did a yeah. 80%. Okay, it's three o'clock, gang. Call the meeting to order. On your roll call. Tom Duster. Here. Scott Holwick. Here. Roger Lang. Here. Renee Davis. Here. Dan Wolford. Here. Ken Houston. Here. Wes Lowry. Here. Kevin Bowden. Here. Hope Bartlett. Here. Alex Merkline. Here. Chris Huffer. Here. Heather McIntyre is here. And Councilmember Martin is not here yet. Chair, you have a quorum. All right, very good. Let's talk about approval of previous month's minutes. Anybody got any comments or questions about last month's minutes? If not, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Kevin. Yeah. Um, Flow this morning at uh, Lyons was 143 CFS. Um, 125 year historic average is approximately 70 CF 76 CFS for the state. Um, the call on the St. Rain is Lake McIntosh, and that has a priority date of uh, 1902. And uh, the call on the South Platte River is Bijou Canal, uh, and that's a priority date of 2004. <coughs> uh, Ralph Price. Reservoir at Button Rock is at an elevation of 6388, which is approximately 12 feet from full, or approximately 13,683 acre feet, um, which is down approximately 2,500 acre feet from full. Union Reservoir is currently at a gauge height of 24.7 feet, or 10,419 acre feet. Um, which is down 2,300 acre feet from the pool. Uh, reservoirs at the end of March were at 76% of full, and which is a little bit higher than last year, about 10% higher than we were last year at this time. So, And for snowpack, I will let Alex talk about that. He's got a presentation for you. Okay. Before you go, Alex, anybody have any comments? Kevin, questions? All right. I know. Um, so we're doing it later in the. He'll do it during the draft report. Yeah. Oh, all right. Fine. All right. Okay. Any project invited to be heard today? Okay. Uh, agenda agenda revisions. I I got a request that uh, we take item. B and put that at the end of the 
committed, so we don't shove people like Hope to the end and she doesn't get on, so we're going to take a little time on that, I'm sure. So if that's all right, can we hold that to the end of the minutes? I mean, the agenda? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, development activity, the rest of that year? Yeah. <clears throat> so you have one development activity that uh, uh, suits your uh, action. It's on Irwin Thomas Conveyance Plat. That's a 32.875 acre parcel located south of Colorado State Highway 119 west of North 119th Street. So straight south of the Costco. Historic water rights were transferred at time of annexation. That transfer satisfied the direct flow at the one acre foot per acre in storage. So therefore, Irwin Thomas conveyance plat will be in compliance with the city's raw water requirement policy upon satisfaction of the 32.875 acre foot deficit at the time of conveyance plat approval. Any questions I can attempt to answer? Is this the property that came in with the Costco property? I mean, is that, is that part of that package that we approved? It's not part of the plat, pro it's not part of that plat uh, package. This would be south of that. This is a completely separate piece. So okay. the last time you seen this land in front of you was part of the uh, annexation when it was annexed under Urban Thomas Annexation Number One. Okay. So well, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. I'm and trying to piece in more Costco. I guess Costco's yeah. north of that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. This this entire parcel was the Urban Thomas Annexation, and then Costco planted right up here and then this is just south I costco and there was a i sort of think of the golden property is it? yeah it was all part yeah. of the golden, golden company okay all right and again the conveyance plat doesn't allow for the development of the property they'll come through with a separate final plat at some point in the future this is just to create an opportunity for them to convey land yeah so just um out of interest more than anything else is there some rounding going on, or, or just, so is 34, is one share of the bonus ditch company, is that you need to put? So that was the water that was transferred at Historic. We yeah. applied a credit for those 34 shares towards the entire annexation, and that, cre that credit satisfied the not less than two acre foot per acre required for the direct flow. Okay. So the 34 directly doesn't tie any way whatsoever to the 32.875, those are separate. It was after that 34 was applied that it left a one acre foot per acre and that's why we have the 32.875 acre foot that they need to satisfy in the storage. But the 30, presumably the 34 shares is worth, let's say, something more than two times 32. Yes, uh, because the annexation was much bigger than that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't recall off the top of my head how big that annexation uh, okay. was. Any other questions? Is there a motion to move this item forward? So moved. Second. Okay, move and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll take, I don't know, why don't we take this yeah, we'll just take this item A, A, and then we'll skip from there. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Is this you, Alex? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> uh, I hope my face is becoming a little more familiar to you all, even this is only, even though this is only my third meeting here. Um, but so this year I was tasked with uh, updating the city's water supply and water shortage implementation plan for this year, and then the early part of 2025. Um, so as many of you might know, the purpose of this plan is to manage the city's water and to try and anticipate, identify, and respond to water shortage that the city might uh, encounter. Um, currently, the conditions we are seeing is around 143% of projected demand for 2024. The snowpack, stream flow, and storage for the St. Brain Basin is around average. Um, and our 2025 and 2026 projections are above the trigger points for an increased drought action level. 
which essentially indicates that Longmont wouldn't need to change from a sustainable conservation level in the future. But of course, that can always change as climatic variability can also change. Um, the city finished the 2023 irrigation season with our local reservoirs at around 86% capacity, and our current projections show that by July 15th, uh, the local reservoirs will be around 96% full. Um, so the current level of drought, we are suggesting uh, that the board uh, keep it at a sustainable conservation level, which will pretty much mean continuing everything that we did last year into the next year. Um, the evaluation of the relevant data, uh, we recommend that we remain at a sustainable conservation level. Uh, here is a graph of the snow water equivalent for the South Platte River Basin. We're just above the median currently. The median. Uh, and as of April 11th, we are at 105% of median for the South Platte. And for the Colorado River Basin, we are at about 106% of median. Here is also a map from the U.S. Drought Monitor of current drought conditions. And we are looking pretty good for this time. Uh, of course, that's always a condition that can change. And I will continue to monitor and try and maintain uh, up-to-date records in terms of trying to evaluate what Longmont's can, drought condition should be. Um, factors that could maybe possibly change Longmont's outlook, uh, an increase in Longmont customer water use over what we have projected, a significant reduction in late summer precipitation, significantly abnormal runoff, and a uh, major fire could also prove pretty disruptive. Uh, I was at CSU when the Cameron Peak fire happened, and that can be incredibly, incredibly disturbing. Uh, quick question on the, um, can you go back on? Yeah. Significantly abnormal runoff, you mean less than we are proposing? Abnormally low or abnormally high you're talking about runoff? Uh, it could be either. Uh, I would figure less runoff would probably be more drastic change to the drought level. You don't see that though? It doesn't look like that now. Okay, no. I'm just curious. Okay, thanks. Do we do any soil moisture monitoring in the Seabring watershed to check for no, the, uh, runoff the, viability? In our CS reports. Okay. We don't do any of our own. Alex, on uh, the previous slide, I think, or two, we talked about a 10% reduction in water use for all city uses. Is that 10% over the 23 year, or is there a benchmark, and we're going to try to maintain 10% less than that benchmark? I mean, obviously, <coughs> if year after year after year, you can do 10%, 10%, <laughs> and then we're struggling. <laughs> or or we're to the point where now we're in trouble, yeah. or we're not meeting. So what is that number? It, it, it's not a... <laughs> We're all looking at you. What did we mean? You are on the right So our, our overall goal is to reduce all of our city water use by about 10% over. If you want to really say it's, it's back to our 2002 drought, and, and what were we using before that? Um, it's more. It's more site specific you know we're obviously not going to reduce every year 10 percent but we we've, we've done a number of as well as our parks department has our, our golf courses our golf courses everybody in the city's worked towards keeping um, not increasing water use for the same amount of use or land It's really just keeping that water that that. conservation mantra mm -hmm. uh, in the in this organization. I'm sorry, I came in late, um, but this is city with a capital means not the whole population. This means municipal uses. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I think as hope will show later, we're all, I mean we're already well well below kind of pre let's say, 
whatever the benchmark that you cited, 2012 or 20, 20, 2002. Yeah. Um, so again, it's just kind of like a, a recognition that the city is trying their hardest to find reductions wherever they can. It's this difference between just kind of general conservation and kind of benchmarking, right? It's like yeah. just and to, just and to give the citizens some credit, we are at about that. If you go by gallons per capita a day. Per capita, yeah. You know, or, or we, we are down. Yeah. You know, about that kind of thing. Which was always our goal, to get there. Both in city use and citizen use. So, Ken, if you go back to 02, there was 10 facilities in the city that utilized water. Operating golf courses, operating parks, right? And from then to now, we've added additional facilities that use water. So you have to consistently adjust for increased use, but on a decreased per unit basis, right? Uh, yeah. So you keep track of that on some level. I mean, because it's going back to O2, you don't have the exact same things. And now that you're in O2, yeah. it's expanded. We have more facilities. We have yeah. more. I think that's what, what Ken was saying. It was to not really site specific. There was probably yeah. some areas that haven't. May have not reduced sure. in that period of time. Yeah. So I think that the goal of that comment was to say we're going to set the standard. We're going to be the ones that the citizens can follow. So yeah. we're going to, when and where it's practical, we're going to try to do those things that get the best conservation first, and then continue to look at other ways to keep making water conservation. And on Hope's report, she has that information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there later today. <laughs> so the other side of that is as we, well, as the advisory, the sustainability advisory board came up with, was it a recommendation for a 30% reduction like three or four years ago? That wasn't the sustainability advisory board. It was a climate action task force that city council came up with that. And how, I mean, how is that based on what we have here? I mean, who makes those decisions? If, if, if you don't mind, I was on the I would task love. force. <laughs> and we had, uh, in, in, the, in the water group, there were just some real fanatics, and it was not based on data at all. They just went, yeah, right. we need they, to they grab save that number water. And, and, you know, they, I had no idea where our watersheds were or, uh, or anything, you know. So they had this fantasy that it was all going to go back into the Colorado. If we, so, yeah, it was based on nothing. Okay. Yeah. And you guys rejected it, and Sustainability Advisory Board rejected it, and everybody with the say rejected okay. it. So we didn't adopt it. Okay. Um, I did have a quick question on the no surplus water declaration. What's the implication for that? I mean, it sounds like it's how we have been lately, but is there does that affect leases or anything? Not not for our one year that we've already have set up and not for our long term. Okay. It would be for people that are coming in front of us at this point. We're saying we don't have any additional water that we're going to willing to lease out. Now over time, as we have, as we're very conservative. We want to, we, since we don't know how much the people are going to use, we're going to make sure that we have enough. Um, it, and so if you went back in history, we used to do our surplus water through the St. Ray Left Hand Water Conservancy District. Okay very labor-intensive uh, effort. We used to do it in-house, which was even oh, worse. <laughs> and uh, so now we consider our surplus water rental, the water that we carried over, okay. that we were unable to take use of this year. So you have a maximum of 10% that you can carry over. So we carried over, I don't remember the exact percentage, let's just call it 14%. So that difference went over into what would be available for the regional pool. So our surplus essentially is going through the regional pool program administered through the Northern Water District. Got it. Okay. But no, no water releases beyond that. No water rental beyond that. We still get a lot of calls on surplus water, just asking for agricultural water. Okay. Um, how, I, I got the feeling that this was similar to last year, but how yeah. long, when you say back in the history of, can you give me a time frame of? When we were leasing this water, and when we stopped, probably prior to the war. Yeah, it was prior to the flood. Yeah, we had stopped. Definitely been in the last okay. over ten, over a decade. Do you have been leasing it? Right. Not beyond the regional pool. Okay. okay. But we.
trained people before that to call us, and now we <coughs> still get still those calls. We're doing a good job training. We're doing a good job training for the next <laughs> 10 years. Okay. Other questions for Alex? Just a quick question. Uh, when's the last time we've been other than sustainable level? Is it go back a long time? Or, uh, 12? 12 maybe? Um, 15. Mm, I think it was, it's at least, it might even, I, for some reason, I think it's even longer than that. We went, I know in 2003 we did for a short period of time, 2002 and 3. Yeah, one other yeah. period. It's yeah. always been sustainable in the. It has been, and I think it's been a course. testament to the citizens doing their conservation and everyone in the water department, yeah. staff, and water board making sure that we always have a good, strong, reliable supply. And yeah. the, was there something declared around the flood? But that was shorter term. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what we said. About, yeah, about 2013, I think we did that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 2002 was kind of a dry year, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no further questions? I guess we're looking for a recommendation to City Council to approve the proposal of Alex's that saying that we're going to uh, keep our sustainable conservation level as is going into this year. So, um, I move that we recommend that to City Council. Okay. Second? Second. Okay. Move and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. So, if you one more question that doesn't have any bearing on the vote, so, so um, but the, uh, like, so if we wanted to kind of, like, think about additional kind of sustainability factors or something, operating within that definition or that uh, those guidelines that are present for the sustainable kind of um, um, uh, designation uh, would that be a place where where that type of work could be done you know so like for example if you i mean just out of, out of just general kind of best management practices kind of water conservation water sustainability like changing some of those bullet points might be a place where that type of work could be done. Absolutely. I think that's true. Yep. Yeah. yeah and, and, and I have to give Water Board a lot of credit. When we first developed our um, drought planning processes, we just said, I can't remember what we called it, just no, con you know, no, <laughs> no designation. And, and, and Water Board told us, you know, you, you really need to think about. You should always be sustainable with right. your water supply. Yeah. So that's really how we came up with the <laughs> sustainable water conservation level is to always have that out there. So yeah, that's a good point, Tom. That's exactly why we did that. Okay. So we're gonna carry eight B to the end of the meeting or the later on. So nine A legislative report, Ken. Yes. Um, we really just gave you a, a quick uh, list of some of the bills that are sitting on on the uh, now the legislature. Um, we really don't um, have a lot. Um, aren't asking for any action unless Water Board wants to take action or make a recommendation on any of them. We're going to kind of tag team on this. Um, We've got um, a couple different ones. Hope's going to talk about a couple of water conservation ones. Chris is going to update us a little bit on the, uh, uh, the I'll call it water, former waters of the U.S. dredge and fill bills that are in the legislature. Um, I would like to highlight just one bill, which is the CWCB project bill, that's the third one on your list there. Um, that's the typical, every year CWCB puts a project list bill uh, in, in front of the legislature. Um, so it's um, House Bill 1435. Um, most of these bills, were, see, a couple of them were taken a position on, most of them were staying uh, neutral on. This one we uh, staff did recommend to the 
um, city council to uh, support it. Um, I've kind of, some years we support this bill, some years we just stay neutral. Honestly, it almost, well, it's, as long as I've been around, it's always passed. <laughs> so it's, it's really a nonpartisan, very positive bill for the state. Um, for us, though, one reason we recommend supporting it, the first is in that bill, it's continuation of the satellite monitoring system. The state has to appropriate money every year. The satellite monitoring system is what the state uses to um, do all of the uh, stream gauges. I mean, we we directly use that. It, it gives us data for all the way from Button Rock to the mouth of the St. Vane. And uh, so that not only us, but everybody in the state. So that was very important. Uh, the second thing is um, uh, Modeling and data analysis for the Upper Colorado River Commission's development of operational guidelines for Lake Powell and Lake Mead. That's obviously a real big issue right now and getting that uh, going. Um, the most direct one though is in section four, which is on page two of the bill. Um, the very first one is uh, CB, CWCB authorized make loans. Uh, and number one is an amount up to 155 million to the Windy Gap Fermi project. When I first saw that 155, I panicked a little bit. <laughs> but um, so, um, as part of it, and it'll actually be part of our catch and move conversation. We, you know, there it's anticipated we'll have some uh, change orders and some additional costs on the Windy Gap Fermi project um, to pay for that. The Windy Gap Firming Project is going to, or it has asked, has applied to the Colorado Water Conservation Board um, for $65 million loan. That's the, the number that's in your cash and new packet. Um, we're 75 or 90 of that, um, 75 or 90 of that. Um, the $155 million is actually the original loan of $90 million which was part of the original financing. Longmont's not part of that. Uh, that was for the participants that didn't bring cash to the budget, or as we brought cash. Um, but we are part of the 65 million, so um, it's kind of weird. This 90 million was approved years and years ago, but because they're increasing it, they have to ask for the full amount, and I, and don't ask me why. <laughs> but um, so that is a direct um, financial interest of the city uh, for this project. Yeah, so, so we did um, recommend that, that um, it hasn't gone too far. It wasn't introduced until um, April 1st, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's passed already, though it's already passed the Ag and Water Resources Subcommittee who has sent it on to the Appropriations Committee. Um, because most of this money comes out of the severance tax, they don't have to come up with money <laughs> at the legislature. So it's, uh, it's you know, very almost guaranteed to pass. But that's one bill of, of great interest to us that um, will, will benefit us. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Chris. We would like to talk a little bit more about the Dredge and Phil and, and Chris, I don't know if you heard yet. Uh, in fact, Scott just got an email from Sean right. that we just found out they've amended um, the Senate bill to s strike the, uh, the DNR, 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 and, DNR and, and put it. So now both bills say CCHE. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. Dan and I got the same email. We haven't looked at the documents, but that's the summary of it. Okay. Um, so, yes, I've been following both the House and the yeah. Senate bill, um, and we, through uh, City Manager's Office, Sandy Cedar, have provided comments to Representative McCormick, who is um, on the House bill. Um, we had some concerns about um, CDPHE being able to administer this type of a uh, uh, program. Um, and the, we gave support to, I guess, what was originally the Senate bill. 
Um, I, I did listen to this, both the agricultural committees for the House and for the Senate, um, and I'm assuming that in the Senate bill at the agricultural committee, there was six um, proposed amendments, and I thought they adopted four of the six, and I thought that they had not adopted changing it to CDPHE, but maybe something happened in between. Um, and I will say, listening to all of the testimony and the way that the state, state house does things, I, I'm very, very appreciative of our council and our courts. <laughs> <laughs> handle business. Um, so we're continuing to watch and follow those, um, but uh, we, we had uh, supported the Senate bill and had asked for the House bill either to be uh, amended or uh, a no vote on that. So that's where we are today. Okay. And Chris, if we have bad information, we apologize. It, it, Again, we're, could very we well didn't read the five attachments that show amendments. <laughs> I'm scrolling through them right now, I, and I haven't seen I will yet, go back so. and look at it, too, just yeah, to see where we're But that we was are. today for sure, so. Um, and things seem to hold and hold and hold for a long time, and then all of a sudden everything happens. So that's... <laughs> they got the long bill done, right? I'm sorry? I said they got the long bill done. Oh, did they? Yeah, and okay. that's probably why the log jam is breaking. Yeah. yeah. This is the typical last three weeks of the yeah. se session. I get it. I get it. Um, so anyway, you'd be happy if they uh, want additional information on that. And then there were two water conservation bills that hopeful um, inform you about. One of them already signed by the governor, so. Yeah, so. Um, Just. Are, are you done with your piece of it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. I hope I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. Go home. Um, all right. So Senate Bill 24005, which is the prohibition of non-functional turf, artificial turf, and invasive plant species. Um, this is the one that was passed and signed by the governor already. So we just wanted to give a quick overview of it. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Um, but basically, it's prohibiting non-functional turf on commercial and institutional or industrial property, um, common interest community property, which is HOAs, um, non-recreational sites in those HOAs, such as the entryways or the breezeways between homes, um, street right-of-ways, parking lots, medians, transportation corridors. Basically, the best way to think about non-functional turf is if people are recreating on it, it's functional if they're not non-functional. Mm -hmm. So anything in our arterial spaces, right-of-ways, anything like that, that has historically just been an easy pass of Kentucky bluegrass will no longer be allowed um, from the state. Um, and artificial turf will no longer be allowed on any spaces except for athletic fields. Um, so those are okay. And they're not allowed on home, homeowners' lawns, is my understanding. But. Um, and then they also defined water-wise landscape. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that out there as well. Um, it's water and plant management practice that's intended to be functional and attractive, emphasizes the use of plants that require lower supplemental water, um, and prioritizes the seven key principles of xeriscaping, which um, were coined by Denver Water. Um, the city of Longmont is in a good place. We feel ahead of the game because we um, just received our code review and recommendations report. So that is, um, we had a code review and recommendations report by a third party consultant and it's um, currently going through the planning and development department leadership. They're taking a look at it um, and then Myself and the sustainability and environmental planner for the city are going to council in July to provide um, information on the recommendations report. But mostly we're gonna be um, those recommendations and ask for direction will be driven by this Senate bill. Um, so we hope to bring code updates, design standard updates driven by this um, Senate bill. Enjoy, so that is great. And then we also have our turf replacement plan 
um, up and going. We should have that by the end of May. And just a reminder, that is a project with Water Now Alliance. And um, they are putting together a plan for us to be able to identify non-functional turf on city-owned properties using a matrix of variety different um, different um, measures so that we can identify turf replacement projects that we want to do on, on city-owned properties, um, including heat index. So it won't only be um, water conservation. We'll look at heat index. We'll look at communities um, like low impact development, um, lower surge communities, those types of things. So it will be great. Hopefully by the end of May we'll have that report um, so we can bring that together. And then lastly, the gray water um, bill that is in legislation. Under current law, local governments may opt in to gray water use, but this bill proposes an opt-out system. Um, according to our planning department, we will opt out as we wait for Boulder County Department of Health to develop regulations. Um, and then our planning and building inspection departments will take the lead on this issue. So the bill proposals, what, what do you see as some of the bigger impacts for us in Longmont? Uh, are, are there anything significant or? For the gray water or for the no, functional? For the, the bill that's addressing turf, the whole, you know, the other things that you mentioned. Yeah, the non-functional turf. I actually feel really good about where we are. I We're ahead of the game because we've already, um, We've already had our codes reviewed. We're already looking at a turf replacement plan. And our environmental and sustainability um, planner, he reviews all of the development plans, all of the landscape development plans for everything that comes in the city, residential and commercial. And so now, moving forward, any projects that come to him with non-functional turf, he will not approve them and send them back for um, redevelopment of their landscapes. So that's good. I feel good about where we're at. I feel like we were heading in this direction regardless of state direction. Um, so I don't think there will be any unforeseen circumstances. That's good. Yeah. In the original bill, or the bill signed, um, gave all the entities until January 1st, 2026. And so honestly, a year and a half, we just had to scramble a little bit if we were starting new today, yeah. but because of hopes, efforts, and water, and our growing water smart contingent in the city, and the work that's done, we're a long ways down the road for this. So that's really gonna. We're we're fortunate not to be starting from ground zero right now. Margie, you got? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't cut no, you were you done? Well, I was just gonna say it will. You know, it will impact the way future arterials, future non-essential turf areas look. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be significantly impactful to us. No, I, I, I think we're going to be fine, yeah. yeah. I was listening to the discussion on the gray water um, because, you know, all the um, same people wanted us to cut our consumption by 50% or 30% or whatever uh, are really into gray water. And, um, you know, in Longmont, we don't want any gray water going down our storm sewers, right? Because we have sensitive riparian areas right here. Uh, but it looks like, sorry, that's okay. Um, it, lo it looks like they're, these are, are they, they were amending it to restrict it to indoor gray water use, like flushing your toilet, did that stick? <laughs> um, it, no, it, it's, that, that is something we would do locally. Oh, okay. Um, we are most likely going to need to do that mm -hmm. for, just from a water rights perspective. Northern Water, um, their board, in the past, we couldn't do gray water at all mm -hmm. because of the CBT component. Now the Northern Board has said internal gray water is okay, but external is not. So um, if we, all, if at some point in the future, if we want to allow it, we'll have to get around that issue, most likely by saying 
no outside gray water use in the inside. And so for both reasons, it's probably going to be that way. Okay. And so they, they've, they've decided that that's a workaround. For, I mean, because historically, CBT water I just could never be reused, and that was the. I mean, that was the agree, and that was the agreement. Let's say that they had with, you know, far downstream uh -huh. users essentially, right. um, and so they've squared this with their own. I, I mean, they're they're trying to update essentially, but while keeping true to the <coughs> intent of that original agreement or something. Yeah, yeah. Their philosophy yes. was if it's internal. Or using your shower water to flush your toilet, it's kind of a securities route inside the house, yeah, but eventually uh, it's the it. sanitary sewer system and it's released, it treated and released. And there won't be, I mean, there won't be evaporative loss and all the things exactly. that you would worry if about. If you reuse it outside. Right. Exactly. Okay, interesting. Any other comments on water conservation? Thanks, Hope. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for me to go through my report? Sorry. Is that next? Okay. I'm next. <laughs> I continue. Um, well, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were done. That's okay. We didn't think you were going to Yeah, yeah good. great segue. All right, carry on. Um, great. So, um, just here to report the annual um, water conservation report from 2023. Um, it's also in your packet, but I. Uh, printed about just in case. So this, um, the graph here is our gross gallons per capita per day and our population line. Um, it continues, our water use continues to decrease as our population increases. This is seen industry-wide um, and a big part of that is the, just the natural conservation that happens as standards um, with fixtures and irrigation standards get better, so our toilets don't flush four gallons anymore, they flush one or less. So that's a large part of it. Um, our 2023 gross gallons per capita per day was 114 gallons, which is down 43% from 2002. Um, and 2023 saw a 19% reduction in demand, um, in our raw water demand from 2002. Um, as was noted earlier, our goal was is 10% currently, a 10% reduction in demand. So last year we doubled that. I would love to take credit for all of that, but we had a, a nice spring. So that's okay. We had a great demand year. Um, so down below here, we have our programs and services lined up by um, our big breadwinners. So Resource Central, we offer the lawn replacement program, the garden in a box discounts, um, slow the flow appointments and water wise yard seminars. So we estimate 4.2 million gallons saved with those programs. Our northern water programs, we have our landscape consultations for large properties like HOAs, nonprofits, churches, um, schools, city properties, irrigation audits on the same types of things. Um, but they also do large property irrigation audits and um, for, for like golf courses or properties that have um, complicated irrigation systems. Um, they, we started a new program with Northern Water, um, our CII, which is Commercial Institutional Industrial Audits. Um, so we put two um, city properties through that audit. We put our rec center and the service center of this building um, through those audits with the Brindle Group and they were really great. Um, and so a large part of this 4.85 million gallons projected to be saved comes from those um, commercial building audits of how much water we can save if we upgraded our fixtures, if we do all of those kinds of things. Um, and then the citywide, we got two community grants. So two HOAs got um, large northern water grants to do turf replacement projects. Efficiency Works is where we do our rebates and discounts. Um, we saved 0.81 million gallons through them. And then our Growing Water Smart, I, I presented to you all a while back about our Growing Water Smart. Um, this is just a, a summarizing that larger report of the 2.3 million gallons saved. So annually, our program saved 12.16 million gallons. Um, our average monthly water use for single family residential accounts is shown right there. 
Um, and so we continue to perform well based on our average. And then below, I won't bore you with reading all of them, but below are some program highlights, Kensington Park, the code review um, for resilient landscapes is that code review and recommendations report that I was just briefly talking about. Um, and then our non-functional turf replacement plan is also that project I was talking about just before, where this is, will help us identify um, how we can be better for our water efficiency standards and practices within our city. Um, and that will help us kind of codify and or put in better design standards moving forward. That's kind of impressive, really. Yeah. Compared to what had used in the past. Maybe Marsha, your little project contributed a lot to the savings too, did it not? <laughs> your long, long project. Your long project. Oh, yeah. Take yeah. a little credit, Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't use that much to begin <laughs> with. <laughs> Sadly. Oh, that's right. Yeah. This is news. Hope. The, uh, x-axis here on water use in 2023 is that like why you presumably it's annual january to, to december okay. we use billing data for that type of graph okay yeah, well, that on there is good any other questions for hope Job, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for not drilling me with all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you want to take nine C? Sure. Um, just a quick update on the Windy Gap firming project. Actually, um, you know, it's, it's continuing to go well. Uh, had a really good um, construction season this winter. Um, we did get snow, but you know, not not. Very little to disrupt the um, construction, probably a little bit less than we would have expected. So they did um, very well on construction this winter. Um, but in since our last water board meeting, um, the projects hit a number of milestones. The first, of course, is that it hit 50% um, uh, of the embankment height, which is really great. <laughs> It means uh, it means everything's going along pretty well. Um, the plant is completely constructed. They've essentially got the grouting work done. Um, the and of course, when you hit once we hit by hitting 50 percent of the height of the dam, it triggered the second payment on the federal lawsuit. So uh, that was a five million dollar payment over over to the West Slope for um, the settlement on that lawsuit. So. That, as you might remember, the fifteen million dollar settlement on the case, five million immediately, uh, five million when it hit fifty percent construction, and five million when it's completed. So uh, we're, we're two thirds away on the payments of, of that, and uh, hopefully that last payment will happen next year because um, currently projected to be complete with the uh, reservoir construction in August. Of, 25, so just a little over a year from now. Uh, the other major milestone was um, on the tunneling, on the outlet tunnel. They actually hold through a couple weeks ago, um, which uh, is very good. <laughs> so now the tunneling is complete. They'll finish the last of the lining of the tunnel. Um, they're actually just now starting to put in the outlet pipe itself through the tunnel. So that's very good. Um, by doing that and starting that, they'll then be able to start construction of the outlet tower, which is um, really the most important thing to get going up because it's at the very bottom of the reservoir and you want to get that tower going up and so that uh, uh, you, you get out of the bottom of the reservoir. Um, the, the inlet works, inlet outlet works, um, the, the The valving for the, and you may remember, we talked a little bit about the valving for the um, control house. Some of those valves were coming from Germany and they were 
kind of being held up over there uh, for ransom, I'll say. Um, find the, the contractors finally been able to resolve that and uh, have all but a couple of the valves on site. Uh, did have to settle with the valve manufacturer on some claims because of the length of time they they uh, had some claims for increased costs that those are now settled uh, unfortunate but they had the valves in germany and <laughs> they wouldn't ship them until that was settled um, very important to get them because the valve house is essentially ready to set those valves in and and cap put the, put the top on it didn't want to have to set them. The, the buildings are designed to be able to take the valves in and out. They didn't want to didn't want to try to do that the very first time. So now that those large valves are uh, going to be coming, we'll be able to get that done. So um, all in all, it's was was a really good month <laughs> since uh, since our last meeting in terms of uh, uh, keeping the project moving forward. Um, no real issues in terms of the. Um, connectivity channel it is of course down um, for the winter at that elevation they don't work in the winter so um, but it's it's functional I mean they actually been running water through it so um, that mostly be plantings and uh, getting the, the diversion structure where it's where you either divert into the reservoir or let it continue down the Colorado River that, Control work needs to be done, um, and just minor cleanup. And the project should be all on the way. Um, probably the most significant um, issue right now is um, uh, nutrient control. As part of the project, we agreed to nutrient neutrality, uh, and that's because of the higher water quality in that area. It's very difficult to find anything to clean up, <laughs> you know. So, um, uh, good news is that the uh, Three Lakes Water and Sanitation District, which um, has agreed to take on a whole bunch of uh, septic systems and bring them into the system to treat the water. Not not that it doesn't get treated somewhat in a septic system, but it certainly doesn't get the treatment than a modern treatment facility would do. So um, gonna get gonna get some uh, some nutrient reduction through there. So um, and that's really all I had on the project. It's, it's just, really just out of curiosity, the amount of labor, cost of labor, to complete zero to fifty percent of the reservoir versus fifty to hundred percent. Is the top portion a lesser amount? It is. That that's why we're I mean it's kinda yeah, that's why we've had a couple of years, well, two and a half years, and we've got a little over a year to go. Because, yeah, as you go up, you're going to get... Yeah. Now, you're going to get a lot longer. <laughs> the width of the dam is what's going to, uh, I guess I'll say, is the challenge now. Um, uh, it's, they're just about, uh, I don't know if you remember the earlier pictures, there's a, there's a low spot on the west side that will have to be filled. Um, they've been building the dam up to a ridge line, and then there's a low spot that will fill, uh, and so they're just about to jump over to that mm -hmm. and do that work because once once you get to the to the ridge line, you you got to take the dam up, yeah. you know, level. Um, when that gets done, then it's about another easily another third larger. Crest width, and that means really long runs <laughs> yeah, with yeah. your core. Um, but uh, yeah, you're getting narrower and narrower. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're halfway in height, but probably closer to two, two thirds you know, actual embankment yeah. uh, constructed. And it, it's, it's going well. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the foundation work is. Done, it sounds like so on the grouting. Yeah. So then all that's below ground. I mean, below-ish ground. So you would never even yeah. realize that it happened necessarily at, if you're just watching the dam rise. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 
that's all the area that, that you have the most unknowns, uncertainty, you know, how, how it's proven. So. You know, just kind of a, not a side, but anyway, I, th I heard that Northern Water is doing tours, busing people out to observation points now. I don't know. They are. Yeah. And just for everybody's information, if you're interested. Yeah, feel free to you know get on their website. Back, Heather just brought it up. But you can get on Northern's website and sign up for any one of the tours. They're doing them every week, and uh, I think you can sign up for May and June right now, mm -hmm. and then a little bit later on they'll open up July. Yeah. But, um, yeah. You see the. Ah. Now it is getting much narrower. You can see this lower area over yeah. here. As soon as they hit here, yeah. then they have to go um, and fill that in, bring that up, and then uh, and then you've got a much longer day. <laughs> you got anything on this end, or is it pretty normal? It's pr pretty normal. I mean, it goes and you know, very steep. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's fun, that's fun to go through those pictures and yeah, watch it go up and down. Great. Um, Any questions for Ken? It's a good report. I'm, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's move back to item 8B, cash and lube. Um, okay, you got a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> so. You know, before we even think about cash and loon numbers, maybe uh, you'd like to take us through what you've got here. Okay, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I did make one other comment. Renee, did, did everybody get Renee's? So maybe after you get through and if you want to, we want to talk about anything that Renee submitted, we, we should do that too. So anyway, go ahead. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so firstly, we wanted to, to bring our, our quarterly review of cash and loot um, forward. Um, and then uh, at the same time, we've been asked to review the overall program, so we wanted to combine um, the two together. Um, we have really two areas uh, that we need to consider when um, looking at the recommendation for the uh, current cash and new price. Um, the, the construction project's been going well. So uh, you, as you recall, uh, in 2020, 2021, 2022, um, we looked at the cash and new program and it was both the Water Board Reclamation and Council accepted that recommendation to um, base the um, primary basis for the cash and lieu on the way to get firming project and that and the full project i.e. the parent project which was the diversion dam and uh, the uh, pumping plant um, and also the when you got firming project so the Original project um, at the last setting, we we decided to use uh, the, the current market value, so to speak, of um, the Windy Gap uh, parent project. At that time, uh, PRPA had sold some units in the, around the thirty thousand dollar per uh, acre foot range, and that's what we used. Uh, 30,000 for the parent project. And we had already set, and we're, uh, um, because we we had made our payment for the construction of the Windy Gap Firming project, that was 18,500 per acre foot. So that, that's the 48.5 that we uh, have currently been using. Um, PRPA put out to auction some additional um, units and a couple of them are closed, but um, they're, they're working on the last of that. So um, we believe by this summer we'll, we'll easily have that information. 
but we weren't ready to, well, we, PRPA asked us not to, not to release any information on that until, until they were completed them with all of them, uh, including taking them to the board of Northern because it's all sensitive. Um, so what we put in the packet today um, was just looking at the Fermi project. Um, and Water Board can, um, we've, we've talked a little bit about the potential uh, change or increase for Windy Gap Firming. Um, it actually, there aren't, there, the actual change orders, there have been a number of change orders executed, and there's a few more in review right now. And of course, we paid the, we already inherited in the 18.5 number is all of the costs for the federal lawsuit. I eat that. that was 22 million for uh, delay costs for the contractor, 15 million for settlement. So, so that's a pretty significant part of it. The cost increases. That's already included in the 18.5. Um, so we know that and it, it's included. But because of how high that was, that that ate into the contingency money for the project. And so we're at a point now where we need to um, plan for uh, covering the change, any late change order uh, requests. Um, pretty much know what most of those are. Um, probably one of the bigger ones was the density of the fill, and I think we talked about that once before. I mean, the good news is, is it's going in more dense. <laughs> I mean, we're getting a better, an even better embankment. That's good. The bad news is we've got to mine more rock uh, because it's going in more dense. So um, that is going to, you know, we've got to pay for the rock that's mined and put in the dam. Um, so that that increases the price a little. And uh, you know, getting valves out of Germany and <laughs> everything else. Um, right now, um, the biggest, the best projection at, at completion of construction was about the $65 million increase that we talked about earlier that's in the CWCP projects bills. Because that um, amount um, is, is a very reasonable estimate of what that final um, bill will be and what additional money beyond the money that was um, originally uh, transferred for the project. Uh, that's been applied for. The CWCB's board has approved the, the, the loan, but it has to be approved by the legislature, which we feel well in the project's bill. We feel it's probably timely now to go ahead and include that uh, in the overall cost of the Fermi project. So that, that's just a simple math of about $750, which is actually, when you, when you consider an $18,500 an acre foot project, it's $750 additional with, given the fact of the federal lawsuit, that's, that's not a bad increase. Um, but we felt it's probably time that we include that in the cash. And really, um, so really we feel that, you know, the option would be to wait until a little bit later until we know, you know, until that actually, uh, those, con those uh, change orders are signed, but um, they really, the final numbers won't change that much, we feel like it's reasonable. So that's why we have in our recommendation that a lot of us may want to consider uh, going from 18.5 uh, to 19,250, which makes the overall uh, cash and move 49,250. So I'll stop there on the recommendation. And then um, the second half of this that I'd like to go into is some um, requests for the board and staff to look at the whole cash and move program. Um, and I guess I'll ask, is you, would your preference be to leave the recommendation till the end or take action on that now? And ju or jump right into the review of the whole project. I, I would prefer to wait till the end. Okay, that that's perfectly fine. So, um, strongly objects, but yeah. Yeah. No. Um, 
So let me kind of set the stage for what we were asked and kind of why we were at, asked it. Um, uh, really, it, it comes down to, you know, the city's been looking pretty hard about what can we do to help um, in development of, of re and specifically residential uh, units for, for citizens. It's, uh, you know, prices of housing <laughs> continue to go up in Longmont, um, and, we, and there is a concern both for attainable housing for, and affordable housing. Um, there's also um, a, a concern that, that, you know, or a, a desire to be um, economically, uh, uh, commercially, which, uh, uh, well, excuse me, <laughs> uh, uh, commercially viable uh, to get new commercial development and industrial development in the community. Uh, so the city's kind of looking at all of its processes in the whole development um, arena. And one of the things that we were asked to do is look at um, cash and loot. Um, that's, um, that's a big ask. I mean, that's a big, that's a big subject. Um, and it really goes back to, you know, um, I will say that the cash and loo, the raw water requirement policy that the city's had for over, formally for over 60 years now, has served the city very well. Um, I, I believe Longmont has one of the best water supplies around uh, because of our raw water requirement policy and our, and, and our water boards and, and councils in the past that have done excellent work. And so that makes us I believe the most challenging, I mean the most uh, competitive uh, in the area um, from that standpoint. That being said, um, we've been asked to look at a number of them. So before, the first thing we wanted to do before we got into um, reviewing the aspects of the, um, specifically the cash and lieu portion of our um, raw water requirement, but also the raw water requirement policy itself. You can't change cash and lieu without changing the raw water requirement policy. Um, the first thing we wanted to do was just kind of give um, a historical context. So in the write-up, because for, for, for the, I know the water board knows our raw water requirement policy, but for citizens, I tried to give a short summary um, if, if any of the citizens want to you know, review these, review the water board and get up to speed on this um, subject. Um, then we wanted to put a little historical context because it's really easy to forget all these numbers and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and over time. So uh, our first one on page 37 of the packet, our first uh, item we put in there was a summary of the cash and the fee, what it's done over time. Um, started out at $100 in 1965. Um, and it's it's gone up and down, and actually, if you if you use it, like the last ten or fifteen years, it's gone down as much as it's gone up, about equal uh, number of changes. So, you know, water board has tried to, to um, follow what is happening in the water resources world, but um, the, of course, we're all aware the biggest increase was was a couple years ago when we went to. Um, the second um, summary is actually cash and lieu received. Um, two, two reasons, you know, obviously we've received most of our cash and lieu in the last 10 years, the biggest portion we've received over the life of the project. Part of that, of course, was because the cash and lieu is, is higher, um, but an equal reason for that is that non-historical water rights are almost exclusively used um, to, to meet the deficit. Whereas today, non-historical water rights are getting much harder to find and much more expensive. I would assume in those numbers, though, there is also a growth, which has also been, I would assume, a little bit like this in Longmont. Absolutely. You can really see 
um, the 75 to 84 period where kind of the IBM and, and yeah. storage tech and those things mm -hmm. kind of busted up. And the housing crash. Then the housing crash of the late 80s. Well, I was well, thinking of the 08. Yeah. The 08. Well, yeah, you can really see the 08 because we went from four to one. <laughs> the 08 crash really, really. Slowed everything down. Well, not only does it slow things down, but you know, before that, you know, we, we the developers were getting a little ahead with vacant lots, yeah. and then not only did they slow it down, but then they just said, "Well, we'll just uh, fill in," and then um, that's probably why the ten million to two thousand, the two thousand fifteen to two thousand and twenty-two was still well, it was eighteen five, so it wasn't way out of range with the other years. Um, but yeah, it was then, then they needed to re recreate that surplus, and so. But that's um, overall we've we've collected a little over eighteen million dollars for cash and move over the life of the program. And then the next um, summary is, you know, what, where we expended that. Um, I just have the the last um, ten years because. I didn't want to send somebody down in the bottom of the basement of the Civic Center <laughs> in dusty boxes. We can do that and we will try to try to get that information, but I didn't have enough time to uh, to get all of that um, exact numbers. Um, and, on, and I hate to say it, but it's, we're right in the middle of our budget season and I didn't want to burden our, our budget folks. Ask them to walk away from what they're doing to get that done. Um, but, uh, essentially, in the last 10 years, um, we've spent about 235,000 in water conservation. Um, water board may recall about 10, 15 years ago, we decided to spend some of the water conservation funding comes out of cash and through water acquisition, because the philosophy is that if you know we can either save water and, and spend our money and that will save having to go get water, or we can go buy water. So um, it, it, was, it was felt, we try to kind of target about half and half um, water for water conservation. We have a base budget that comes out of water rates, operations, and then we have additional money that comes out of water conservation. So that's about 235. Um, we have about a lot of Direct water rights in the last 10 years, we spent about 200,000 on water rights, which is not a whole lot. So, um, yeah, mostly, <laughs> yeah, mostly the next item, the one you got for me. We haven't wanted, we've been trying to basically save that money, cash flow money for the Windy Gap Fermi project because um, once we issue the bonds, <laughs> we pay that every year. Um, and so we spent, uh, I can't remember exactly, around four or five million for what, cash that we sent up to Northern as part of the overall package for payment for Windy Gap. Um, and then we've, we've made a payment this year, I think it's about 1.9 million on the bond, and um, we'll, we'll continue to do that uh, each year. Um, the amount of the Windy Gap Fermi project that was set for new development will be paid for cash, cash moved to water acquisition. The amount that's for existing, kind of firming up, we did firm up some of the existing water supply, and that's that comes out of construction fund, or excuse me, operations fund. Uh, and I don't have the exact numbers on all that because I don't have the amount they paid this year for the bond. Um, but we'll get those exact numbers um, over time. Uh, then we also um, started an economic development incentive um, that comes out of cash and lieu. Um, that's very, very limited, um, but in fact we've only used it one time. <laughs> it's been there for about 10 years. And, uh, it's only been used one time. To be honest, it was the Tosco. Um, and, and so that was $478,000. Um, and then we also pay for water court, some water court costs um, for transferring water rights that we acquire. So that was 66 cents. So we're, we've got about $12 million um, that we've paid out in the last 
from 10 years of the 18. Uh, we've got about $5 million in the water acquisition fund right now. And, um, and then we had to spend a million or two prior to 2013 on other water rights. So that's kind of where we are overall. But um, we're, we're sitting fairly good with the water acquisition fund, uh, you know, uh, at five million. We're, you know, we're, we're concerned that we continue um, to have enough money in there to help pay for the Windy Gap firming project because those payments come every year. Um, at five million plus one, that's enough for about two and a half years and then we'll have some uh, water acquisition funds coming in in the future. Um, hopefully to stay uh, up, up with or ahead of that um, that bond. Um, it is it is backed up by our. Um, in addition to the to the cash cash and water, water acquisition fund, we also have a windy gap surcharge on the tap fee, and that windy gap surcharge plus the um, water acquisition is what we'll use to pay for windy gap firming. Um, and that should keep us up there, but um, we'll, we'll see. We never, you never know the future. <laughs> so that's, that's really where, where all of that's going on. So then I wanted to jump into um, some of the questions that we were asked, um, specific, and, and we're not, uh, go ahead, Dan. No, going back to the water acquisition fund. Yes. Wasn't the water acquisition fund used to purchase part of Sandstone Ranch? Some of the water rights associated with it. And I'm just thinking of some of the other things. I thought that water acquisition fund was used to buy the, the more recent corner of McCall Lake. And wasn't the acquisition fund used to buy the Adams property up at Button Rock? So I'm just saying. Okay. I thought you, that was operations. Yeah. Fund. Okay, that paid for that. Yeah, but I was just thinking that there was a lot of uh, because I just off the top of my head thinking, you know, like sandstone, the water was a lot more than two hundred six thousand dollars. I'd have to, yeah, see, but that was more than ten years ago. I'd have to go back. Well, I mean, in your reign between. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because that was ninety-eight or whatever. Yeah. Okay. For sandstone. But I'll certainly go back and look. I'm just, when we get back. Okay. Back. Yeah, yeah, sorry. But I, no, just. Yeah, time goes. <laughs> I'm back here. <laughs> I get it. Can't just the surcharge um, review annually and reset, uh, or is that indexed in some fashion? Um, because obviously there's a component of that that goes along with inflation, right? Um, it, you know, it has been um, looked at a couple of times. It really, it's based on, it's a percentage of the tap fee. So as the tap fee goes yeah. up, it's going to inherently go up a little bit. Right. But, um, so it's fixed. It's, well, it's yeah, a, it's, it's a percentage of the, yeah, okay. uh, thanks. Like a surcharge of 120%. I, I don't know what it even is right now. Yeah, it's helpful. Thanks. That, that, uh, and just a question before you get into the review issue, number one, where did these questions come from? Um, it originally came down from the city manager's office, who was looking at overall city um, and everything that's happening. Um, I mean, is, so, was council involved in any of these questions? Was it just? I, I, I'm not. You know sure. anything about these? Yeah, questions? council council did not um, send any question approve any questions to okay. be sent to you. All right. Okay. So these are city manager driven. Yeah. City manager's office asking us to review it. Okay, you want to get going on? Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll jump into them. Um, the first one is, um, what is the impact of cash flow on the cost of development in the community? Um, one of the things we wanted to do was kind of put it into perspective. And so what we did is we took um, uh, what the, uh, but the actual cash and lieu that has, has come in, so we looked at all the plats for the last 10 years, 
Um, there were 36 flats with deficits ap approved. 70% um, of them paid some, at least some cash in lieu. A lot of developers will pay, bring in some non-historical water and then just kind of supplement, you know, the last little bit with cash in lieu. Um, uh, 602 acre feet of deficit paid by cash in lieu. Um, two deficit from non-historical water is 249 acre feet. But of over 10 years, that was that represents 5,300 units um, of flats that had deficits. So that, that comes out to $2,298 per unit. Um, which, you know, putting per, that into perspective. Per living unit? Per, per dwelling unit, yes. Okay. Well, I would say per house, but a lot of, anywhere no, it's mostly I mean, per apartment. I mean, if you have a 20, unit apartment they're in that number. Mm -hmm. Twenty units. That's great. Right? Yeah. Wait, no, say that again. So is that per unit of of single family housing or is that per unit of multi family housing? It's uh, a average total all units. All of yeah. okay. All units. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. And and uh, admittedly we're putting in more if you put in apartment units your per unit cost is gonna go down. Wait way, way down. Um, if you have housing, you know, single family housing, then it's a little bit higher. Um, if you've got one big, huge business, <laughs> you know, it's much higher. Um, so what we wanted to do is, was kind of put it in the context of, of, you know, if you put as a unit cost today and how much of that is apportioned, would you ascribe to cash and loot? Not, not that we would argue that everything you we can do to bring down the cost of housing is good, but just wanted to keep it into perspective of what that is. Um, and keeping in mind that that's the cash flow portion of it, not the, not the uh, non-historical water. You know, let me just ask you a question. Your first sentence as far as it's expressed the cash, cost of cash flow has recently created a substantial impact on the ability of development. I assume that's saying it created a, a negative input, impact on development in the long run. Yeah, it's making it. Now, here, here's, there's a perception out there that development is not slowing down in the long run. And it's fairly robust. Now, that's just a perception I hear from a lot of people. So my question would be, is, is development Factually slowing down in Longmont. Cash and Lou aside, I'm just curious about that. So it's a really good question, and honestly, I've only been looking at the water stuff. That side of it, I, I can't tell you, but we certainly can get that information. I, I don't know, Chris, do you have a, might have a little more sense than I. If you look at straight numbers of, numbers of plots that we've processed or numbers of permits that are going out, permits is a little hard because I think we're still up in the seven to eight thousand permits, but what are those permits for per year? Um, but the feeling, which we can put numbers to, is that we are processing fewer plats and fewer units per year than we have in the past. But wait, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, That's, sorry, I'm jumping in. Um, <laughs> 2020 like hit building department processes hard and so there's I think your data could have noise in it but also interest rates have gone up I mean there's a lot of different factors that drive that drive this I think it's a great question but it it's going to be hard to really suss out is it because interest rates have gone up and so the housing market's cool yeah I, I don't know if we yeah. can put a specific cause to affect yeah. Um, but I think what Ken is showing too, though, is that the, the overall impact of, ca or, of paying cash in lieu for a unit is not substantial. Is not what? Is not substantial. When, when you are selling a unit for $300,000, $400,000, $500,000, $200,000, and dollars 
$2,300 is not substantial in that total cost. Is that accurate? Well, I think there's a couple other factors coming in here. So um, there's a lot of interesting public perceptions going around, and some of them are very active public perceptions in that the public is raising a fuss, um, uh, probably against their own actual interest. But um, you know what's, what's really going on in, in terms of the council is that we don't like to approve single family developments. Say that again, Mark. We don't like to approve single family developments. So um, you know, on the one hand, you can build apartments or you can build townhouses and single family developments, but because of the construction defects law, nobody wants to build condos, which is probably what we really need in Longmont. Um, so is that idea or conception just cooled off at all, or is that alive and well, people still don't want to touch condos? People, well, it's not that they don't want to touch them, it's that, that it's very expensive to touch them because- The well, lawsuit and stuff? No, because, because they have to buy insurance policies to finance their project, and um, stacked, stacked flat type condos because they've got so many units per building. Mm -hmm. The way the construction defects law is written is is the makes the insurance policies really high because the presumption is that you're going to do a class action thing. And you're going to have to touch every single apartment if one mm -hmm. apartment is defect or one flat is defective. So. Um, and the legislature does not seem to have gotten their heads around that problem. Um, so there was actually a, 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 law, a bill that I think failed, but I, I'm not sure. Um, but there was, there was a bill that actually made it worse. You know, that they, they, want, they wanted to add consumer protections, and so they like toughened up the law in the, in the form that it's already in. Um, and like I said, I, you know, this, excuse me, the city um, weighed in to oppose that, and I don't know whether that does any good or not, but, um, you know, the, the legislature's not on the right track to fix it yet. Um, but and, and this condo situation's got to be a state problem. It is. It's a state, it's a state problem, but, but but Boulder County is worse off than most places because we're landlocked. We have landlocked ourselves. Yeah. And so um, it's hard to find places to build single family homes. And um, right now what's happening is we're building a lot more for sale townhouses. And the Mustang project that the city just did, um, real soon now we'll, we will release the um, the data on that that pretty much tells you how to build for sale um, properties at least cost. Um, but uh, you know that that is a problem. And then to go all the way back and answer the question, it means it means that the per unit is a is a bigger chunk of a small of of smaller units because what's happening is that we are um, we are. Um, tending to approve high density proposals and the other thing that's going on is that they're taking a long time to get permitted and partly it's because the neighborhoods are rising up and forcing charrettes and lawsuits and all kinds of craziness because they don't want it built at all. Um, so. One thing that I wanted to say, because I've got to leave at 4.30, unfortunately, just when they, we're getting, <laughs> to good stuff. getting to the good stuff, but I read Renee's memo, and the thing that jibes the most of all, and it was a good memo all, overall, I thought so, but, um, but the thing that jibes the most with any of the recommendations that Renee made was that, that we want to um, uh, revise the fee in lieu less often and uh, on, a, on a date certain because that's consistent with the affordable housing fee in lieu. That's the feedback we got from developers. Just to clarify, 
I proposed annually, which would be more often. A less frequent review, more often change. Because we haven't changed it in a year and a half, two years, yeah, two no, years. No. In fact, well, yeah. what, I, what I was well, going to say about it was that, that a, a year apart probably isn't enough. And what difference does it make if you say it's two years or three years the way the fee and lieu is? Because, because what a, a developer cares about is can he get lock in his financing before it's going to it's going to change under his feet. And if, if it takes him two years to get financing, then he can look at where he is in that revision cycle and uh, do well with the bank. What? No double digit increases. Oh, yeah, although. Um, Steady. Yeah, you plan for I think better. I think keeping it, keeping it small is probably a good idea in general, but Interestingly enough, on the affordable housing side, they didn't say that. They said what we want is to not change when we've got when we're in conversation with a bank. Yeah. And um, they they were actually advocating for um, a big increase in fee and lieu because it was so far out of balance. Um, they just wanted to know when exactly it was going to happen. So. I, I unfortunately well, I, have a thing. I don't think that's a big deal, timing it kind of on an annual basis. Everybody understand that this is, right. there's a change here, yeah. we're going to change it, and this is the periodically when we're going to do that stuff. Yeah. I don't think that's a big issue. But anyway. Well, it's a big issue for the developers. Well, right. no, I mean to put it on a schedule so the uh -huh. developers know when it's yes. at. That's my point. It's not hard for this board to do. That's a sense yeah. of Yeah, <laughs> no, it makes sense. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just going to say, our variables don't move as much as some of the other competing jurisdiction variables do because the other ones that were based solely on CBT saw the rates go like this in a period mm -hmm. of about nine months. Yeah. So they had to adjust yeah. relatively nimbly to reflect the true market price. Well, we're not based on that. Our costs will not change substantially year to year based, at least upon what we're basing on today. Yes, it's, yeah, especially if with the report that we changed it, but yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I, so I the developer agree. perception is based upon other jurisdictional the challenges that they face. And the yeah, the, the developer perception is they were really caught in, in between a rock and a hard place this year because yeah. you know we had all the supply chain stuff and the inflation and all of that who thought it really messed up their costs and their financing. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, but but the main point they said was they want a date certain, yeah. and and it might be in, even interesting to um, align that change with the city's other fee and loop changes. I don't know some somebody that understands construction better than me, but it, it seems like that's a coral area is that you would like all those changes to happen sort of in lockstep. Mm -hmm. I hate to see you leave, Marcia. Do you think there's anything else I know? I'm well, feeling, I'm fair, hey, feeling I'm fairly like, stupid these well, days. Well, you, I mean, yeah, right. I, I'm always trying to get a sense of where the council is on things, and you're, yeah. you're our link yeah. to yeah. where the council is. So I'm just saying, this, you know, we may not finish this discussion today. But, okay. You know, so if we don't, please come back next time. When, but I, I don't know if we will or not. But yeah. it's, a, it's, a lot, it's a meaty issue. Yeah, it's very it, important, it, too. It, it is, because we have a big housing deficit, which is, you know, it's, it's more difficult because the public doesn't like building housing right now. So before you leave, I'm at, can I ask you, do you think 2300 bucks is a significant impact to development? You know, I don't. From have, your I truly don't have a feel. Okay. I don't. Well, it's a little different than that too. It's not twenty three hundred bucks. What's it's it's like it's some incremental small amount of twenty. It's like three hundred bucks, really. I mean, like yeah, ten percent. That's only five thousand. I mean, units. well, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is like, we would have to relinquish the entire cost of all the water in order for twenty three hundred dollars to be the actual amount that like a developer would 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 see, right? Like. If we changed our procedure such that there was a 10% change or something, that's only like $2,200 or $220 or something. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So 
Are we done with issue one? <laughs> Aren't you glad you got yours out of the way, Hope? <laughs> well, we, we sort of got into issue two as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with the concept of timing it. I, my personal opinion is we ought to set something in the fourth quarter and tell them we're going to be effective in January 1st. Something easy for everybody to understand. Yeah. They would like a longer lead time. I was going to say we should we should probably have our process and I like if we were to make some change, right? We should make our process in place such that we make a decision by June that gets implemented by January or so. Or, or, or you know, city or does their budget. Months. They do revenues and expenses, yeah, so why is it incorporated in the budget process? So that everybody knows that everything's going to get a three percent or four percent or what that might look like, and it's set for the year. And boom, and it's incorporated into the budget process. Yeah, I don't know what the lead time is. I, Maybe a quarter's time is too short. A quarter's time is too short. Okay. For, well, again, for input. specifically for developers financing projects, and remember, you know, they've got to get all that stuff done before they do much with the city. Okay. So. And in context of the overall. Discussion we have been asked about the possibility, and which we'll at some point we'll get in, we'll have that conversation too. We're asked, Is there a possibility that, and I'll just make up a time when they sign the annexation agreement or when they sign the plat, can, can we lock in. establish lock in, in for a set period of time? And, and I'm just going to make up in two years um, that then they would know. Because what we don't want to do is lock it in. We, we, we occasionally have somebody, yeah, I, I had this plant in 1967. Yeah. You know, and we'll get well, something yeah. platted 20, 30 years before. But, but there's, a, there, there's, a, there's a, a request out there that well, can we help the developer by, by giving them a certainty of two years. Three. <laughs> Three. I should have prefaced all of this. We're, we're not going to even ask one of them for recommendations today. We're, I'm going to come back next meeting with a proposed schedule where we look at all of this. It's going to take some time. So all, all we wanted to do was outline all the issues today um, so you can be thinking about it. Um, we've got a whole ton of information we've got to get for Water Board. Uh, to make decisions, but um, the, this is exactly what we want to come back, Marcia. I'll, I'll watch the last half uh, now that you're going to recommend next month. I'm, I'm, my yeah. conscience is yeah. like, I, we, won't, yeah. we won't wrap this up this meeting. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, we're, we're, yeah. we're honestly thinking we wanted to introduce it today, probably in May and June. We'll come back with um, a schedule. For doing the whole process in probably July, August time period, we'll come back with. There's a number of studies we need to do to, to provide Water Board with information like, um, you know, what are, what are all the other communities doing? We can bring that information. Um, we also want to um, actually talk with the development community and find out directly from them. What, what is the biggest impact to them? Uh, you know, if, if we don't want to be do, we don't want to be changing this all around and have them saying, well, actually, we like it the way you had it. Well, do, do so. Go ahead. Who said so? I understand. So, with that said, part two of today's discussion is really just information for us in the initial issue of bumping cash in lieu to forty nine two fifty. Is something you want to prove today, or is that again down the road? Um, if 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 you're comfortable with just doing that as a change, then then yes, we can take a recommendation and we take that water. Work. If you want some immediate changes to the code, then that'll take a little bit longer. Um, as we go through this, one of the requests we've had is don't do a lot of changes, so it may. We have to put it in. Are you comfortable doing this change now and waiting for the change on the parent project? Um, maybe a year from now. Um, or would you rather wait 
I mean, we'll know this summer the last information um, on PRPA, so we could we could maybe roll no, those two together. We don't have the information. I, my feeling is. Let's not do anything until we get the information. Okay. And you know, I mean, I don't like to make decisions if there's something that's going to impact. Yeah, especially with everything we're talking so about. So, I, my preference is we don't change anything until we get all our information. Okay. And, and I'm going to respectfully contrast that. And that is, is I would like for us to have some deadline of not just waiting for the next best thing. I feel like we're, <clears throat> we're overdue for a change, is my, is my opinion. We are overdue for a change. It's been two years. We had some information in October and a plan to do so, and now here we are in April and we haven't changed. So, again, this is why I think a deadline, an annual deadline, could be helpful for the board because sometimes it feels like we're waiting for the next best next thing. <laughs> the what next if we, uh, quarterly review, and it, I'd like us to get to we'll swing ahead. to our bat. I was just going to ask Renee, so. When I read your memo, and thank you, by the way, for the, for the thoughts on the page, because it it's really helpful. Um, I guess I didn't understand until I hear you speak about it now, that like, it, are, are you suggesting that at those yearly intervals, that there is a change, that there's almost like a, yeah. a necessary change at every single one of those intervals, rather than, it's not the quarterly review that we do right now where we say, well, let's just leave it how it is. But instead, it, you, it sounds like you're, it's a, you're saying fewer reviews, but more individual punctuated kind of changes. Absolutely. And, and I know it's going to be differently, but my belief is, is that if you have a 3% increase or a 5% increase or you know whatever's kind of warranted, but if you do that annually, that's great. If you do it every two years and now it's a 10% increase, that seems to me like it would be hard to deal with. I know I as a rate payer, which is a different thing, but when you when I see a 10% rate increase, I'm like, ouch, that hurts. And if I were planning, you know, our cash in is small <coughs> compared to a unit, but it's a chunk of money. Um, yeah. And to bump that up by 20%, that seems to me to be like, I would like to see small annual changes. Well, and not just review, but changes. I mean, we're recommending city council changes, but take action and kind of a, a do it sort of thing, like the deadline element of we're going to do something. Well, why so, don't we target that we will do something this year to be effective January 1st and use that kind of as a, as a guideline? So. So maybe we need to make the decision in June, July, I don't know what, but I don't think it makes sense, again, to do something now if we're waiting for information. I, that's just my feeling. But I think we ought to have something targeted that will make a change and have it effective the 1st of January. That's just my thoughts. I, I was just going to say that, I mean, so, you know, from like a developer's perspective or something, right, like they buy, I don't know, two by fours or something like every day or something, like close to anyway, right? And they, they, so they see the change in timber or something like instantaneously, right? Mm -hmm. Water sells so infrequently that we really have no understanding of like the market price of water at any given moment until those, those, those momentary or episodic kind of, um, instances when there is an auction, when there is a uh, Especially something, the Windy Gap you know. parent project, I don't think those are going to be selling every year. It's not a bit. Right. No. Yeah. No. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, I feel like what we've been doing is that we wait until we see what the real market change is. It's just that there, we, we haven't had the information in these last two years to really say that we should make a change. Because we, we have, we, those two years have been kind of devoid of information, right? And so if we were to implement some kind of, uh, I don't know, I mean, you, you'd have to have a really good discussion, I guess, about like how do we make decisions based on what we think the rate or what we think the water, how the water is going to change in value over this time to kind of like, to, to kind of um, average over these episodic changes, right? So in other words, rather than just two years from now change at 
what if over the next, you know, I don't know, every six months it goes up 1% or something, right? Like it's, it, it's a different mindset. In one instance, we have these periodic instances when we definitely know what the water's worth. The other instance, we're gonna be kind of like assuming or kind of like projecting into the future what we think the water will be worth in two years and then try to smooth over this huge change. But, but right? Dealing with what we have now, what date do you propose, you know, do you think we'll have the numbers that we've been waiting for on the sale. Will that be done uh, by uh, June, you yeah. think? Uh, it might be done for the June quarterly meeting. Um, I, I just yeah, don't know I, when they'll end up taking it to the board. Yeah, um, it's out of your control. I'm pretty this sure it's this summer. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all for um, it summer this summer. Uh, just a, because I'm a rate setting nerd, and a system development charge nerd. I was reading a case called Krupp versus Breckenridge, where a developer sued the city of Breckenridge because they didn't like how the SDC was calculated. And one of the findings in Krupp, I'm not an attorney, but I'm gonna wait out of my depth, was that you don't have to have perfect information to set a fee. You have to have reasonable information. And you have to have like a rationale that's consistent when you do it. But you don't always have to wait for perfect information. So I think that we can also use that to say, hey, we're going to make a careful, deliberative change, but we may not have perfect information. Now, I'm OK if we want to wait a couple months. But I also feel like we've been waiting. And I really would have loved to not have to have paid any of my inflation that I've experienced this last two years. What was that last thing you said? I would have loved to not have to pay any inflation the last two years. And right now, our development community has not had to pay any inflation or any increases for two years mm -hmm. on cash and loot. They've had a, they've had a, a stay. Of We've been too easy on them. I, 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 I don't want to be too I harsh, but I don't want to be too easy. Yeah. No, a, you've got to thread a needle here. And so when you say wait till January, I'm like, oh, I wish I could get that break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, so I would like to do it soon, but I would also love information, and yet we may not get perfect information. Well, I don't have a clear date for you. You know, and again, the parent is, is one thing. The change order is another. Do we anticipate another change order? I mean, we know that 750 bucks is the cost for the change order. Is that not correct? That's yes, that's the anticipated change to the completion of the construction. You know, I have no problem. I don't bump yeah, it could go up. to 49 250 it's less than inflation. Well, if, oh, if well let, me, let me tell you what my, well, so I'll tell you what my problem is. Cash and Lou, we were looking at cash and Lou number last September. Of, uh, took it up to what? 63. 63. And now all of a sudden, we're looking at 750. I don't get it. I just, you know, to me that is, what happened? What, weren't the numbers any good? You put together last fall. Well, to go from one to down to seven hundred fifty. Speculative, I think. No, I, I think they were based on one sale, right? And I remember being the person that said, "Hey, wait, it's only one of the units sold. Can we get all five units sold?" Yeah. It was me that threw the flag on the play, guys. Yeah. Um, I think the September one included re reflected oh, the contemplated uh, parent water uh, adjustment, mm -hmm. where this. 750 only looks at the one half of the equation, only looks at that right. construction cost. So it's just a matter of coming up with what is that, what is the value of the parent water? And we, we thought we knew it, but um, what the get exit on PRPAs ask us, no. they're not going to share what that actually is going to be until they, they close on it. So but that change order is a known quantity. Yes, that's yes. right. That's correct. That is no. But if you change it modestly in the short term mm -hmm. with the expectation that it's going to change it substantially when that information is publicly available right. and on which, and Chris, you can shoot me if you want to, but mm -hmm. I'm not the attorney for Longmont. You guys have counsel, so you can ask counsel what's defendable and what's not defendable, right? Yeah. Because it is a rational basis, it's a reasonable basis. And that's not for us to say. That, that's for legal counsel for the city to say, right? That's, that's where the big step's going to be. And the timing of that is unknown. 
and the price to that is unknown, but it's going to be the big piece, right? So putting it up by 750 for the next 90 days is not going to garner a lot of revenue for the city if there's development going through in the next 90 days paying that. The next step's going to be substantial. And yeah. We don't know the timing, we don't know the price, but we know it's going to be substantial relative to the $750 per unit um, cost for um, takeovers, right? So it's a conundrum and it's, it's frustrating as all get out because we talked about this well, months ago. My point is 750 is kind of meaningless. Well, and my only point is that 750 is at defend. mini school yeah. and it's not that big ticket item. Yeah, but I understand, so, but. Keep it it's small but defendable. So yeah, and then that's that's how you raise it twice. That's, then probably within yeah. Yeah. Oh, you just raised well. it. But you know, but you know, I think if we were to say, probably not. No, no, no. If we were to say, <laughs> we're going to raise it now today. We're going to recommend a raise of this small amount, and then we're going to wait until we get parent project data, and we're going to raise it again in October, and then starting in 2025, we're going to aim for an annual raise. That's, that's a little clearer and a little less, and it gives us the deadline to make the choice. I think that would be still legit. I think that would still be fair and clear to our public. Um, you know, because we're kind of in this older mode of quarterly, and we can deliberately change it and then say, okay, now we're going to go to an annual. We can go to an annual starting in 2025. And for me, as long as it's different. Yeah. Me too. I don't want to What'd you say? I said, as far as I'm concerned, as long as whatever we do is defendable. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to get this. Oh, would you have something? Yeah, that, I was just going to say that's always been been my thing too. I, I remember so back in 2022, it wasn't just an increase in raw water value, let's say, that it was a complete change in the mode by which we evaluate. The process, right? We we didn't just notice that there was an auction of water that increased the value. Instead, it was no, we're going to include now the original parent project amount in this new cash and loop, right? And and so we you you all not we I, I barely did anything, but but you all went out and found. Um, how much a recent sale had 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 valued that water at, right? The parent project water. But that recent sale wasn't from 2022 either, was it? No, it was much older. Much older, yeah. And so the most recent data that the cash in was based on for 2022 was, let's say, five years ago or something. And it's been two years since then. So every seven, like, it feels like every seven years or every you know, eight years or 10 years or something, we get like little episodic updates, right? And so I think the question becomes, what do we do in between, right? Like how do we value water in between and how do we make that defensible? Because that's, that is, I think all of us, all five of us have, all, have said that now, like we need it to be defensible to feel comfortable with making these recommendations. And the question becomes when you only have dots on your graph that go every 10 years, the defensible part, that's entirely defensible because if that was actually a, a sale. What do you do in between that makes it, that still satisfies our need for the defensibility of the whole thing? Okay. You, you know, one approach could be, and the city of Fort Collins contemplated this, was a, a total water rights portfolio valuation. That you um, buy into their existing portfolio? Right? Yep, which is the buy-in method for SDCs, but it also looks at kind of a broader swath. Um, and we could look at maybe a bigger market of water sales, not CBT, but you know, maybe water sales of rights all along the South Platte River. And then we could have stuff that's not every 10 years. You know, we could have a few more data points in there. Yeah, it's more robust. Yeah, but it, it is it germane to the same brain? I don't know. We need to be careful there. We need to be smart. And just to your point, Renee, I think that that was what the city manager's office was thinking about, is that we have garnered however many acre feet, 28,000 acre feet, that, that we basically have that in our possession now, absent the ones that we, the water rights we expect to get in with uh, land that's still annexed in. I want to make sure that everybody understands that too, that we have 
our overall long-term plan anticipates getting all of those water rights. And I don't want to lose that in this whole conversation either. That there's water rights out there that we still need to get. Um, but that by by or paying for um, Chimney Hollow, we've basically garnered the storage that we need. And so can we, what, what I've heard from them is, can we set that, that that's a, a price that we have paid and that people are basically buying into that um, instead of trying to look for these one-off sales that, that there's, there's one data point that is now setting or changing everything. Can we say that this is what we paid and do we modify that on an annual basis based on inflation or some other index um, that the city has paid this much but as you buy into it you obviously the over time um, the cost of money is going up so we need to index that somehow. Um, I think that that was their idea of how we give predictability to what cash and would be. Um, instead of, oh, well, there was a sale six months ago that now set this price, and now we're going to raise it another $20,000 per acre foot. Uh, but I think to your other point that you said earlier, is that fair to everybody else that has paid in over the last 60 years? So, just well, one thing to think of. Yeah. Are you willing to wait a couple months until we sure. get into summer and see if we've got more information and we're still struggling with it? Maybe move on then and do the adjustment. Is that? I'm open to that. Yeah. You're all right with that? I'm yeah. With that. Yeah. I would like us to maybe have a deadline of trying to get an adjustment made in 2024. We'll do this table a change of cash in lieu and well I, yeah and you know, we have our next quarter I, I don't think it's gonna break anybody's heart because that's but that's let's do that okay because I because I, I think you make a good point if we can't be credible with our data and I mean that's I don't want to be defending something I can't defend and speaking of credibility I want to say something that I don't think is happening but does it look fair if we change it at this point, but a huge development's come in right before that? And the, the point of change is one of our random quarterly reviews. Did we let somebody sneak in under the wire? I'm not saying that that's what we do, but there is a, I think there's a potential perception of we're not getting it done at a, at a set time and a set way, and stuff is getting biased and we're not capturing full cost. Yeah. So there's a little credibility there too, which is why I think the deadline is also it improves uh, our credibility. I, I think setting something that everybody understands and is when it happens. Yeah, it would prevent some of this stuff coming in under. Yeah, the fire. perception that that's what's happening. Roger, if I could just one more comment, um, Chris. Thank you for that perspective. That helps to hear what you're hearing and channeling to us because that yeah. isn't really that obvious, honestly. I just would point out that. And I think you're right about having some index by which to value other than single data points every 10 years or so, or less frequently, or maybe more frequently in the future as people start to build out their portfolios and excess when you get water, they can realize they can let go of a little bit, and so then, you know, all that. But, but the, the hard part is it's hard to tie, in my opinion, the price of water to any you know, CPI, construction, whatever that is. It would have to be a fairly novel water rights index, and the South Platte River might be that. It might be a, a way to look at that. It's actually, it's actually not bad. If you look at the whole South Platte River over time, it does. Yeah, I was saying if you bring the South Platte River, I'm just saying if you're looking at regional elements and all that, it really hasn't held up very well, in my opinion, um, relative to inflationary uh, pressures because it, it it doesn't reflect building or construction. I mean, it just doesn't. Right. It's it's. <laughs> It's the buyers and the sellers that set the market, and they do it for very different reasons. So, but the index idea is good, and it would make sense to think about how we could use that to replicate the increase in value of water because it's a very unique asset, and it's very local. And you can look at a basket and maybe it more closely 
um, follows the trend line. So I think that's good. That was a good comment. Appreciate that. You got something, Tom? Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, we could, you know, this almost starts to look like maybe creating our own index, which you know would be hard to do defensively, as we agree upon here. Um, and so, but like you could potentially use those episodic sales to adjust. So the, we wouldn't be as nimble, perhaps, as uh, doing it this way, like being able to adjust the price, uh, our, our cash and loot price instantaneously or something in response to, to water to the water sales, but like if we developed or if we decided upon some kind of percentage, for example, that you know every year that it will go up by this percentage, and then those 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 sales essentially become kind of like mechanisms by which we adjust the percentage, right? It it would be a slower a slower roll. In other words, like we wouldn't necessarily say, well, okay, we're going to adjust it to sixty three thousand next time that we meet or something but instead like we use those sales just uh, essentially say well if you know it's increased this much in the last 10 years let's just say that you know let, let's assume that we need to go up by that percentage every uh, every year or some you know the number divided by 10 that percent every year or whatever and and then any sales that do happen then of course we would use that to then readjust the, the percentage or something like there's some other middle ground, perhaps we wouldn't be responding instantaneously to these changes, and so we would be leaving some money on the table. I think when it's all said and done, but but at the same time, it would be more predictable for our predictable. community, I and maybe a little less money left on the table. But to get to a schedule, if, are you comfortable with deciding that something will be effective January first? Is that or sooner. something? Pardon? Or sooner? I would say. At least make a commitment that we're going to make a modification by the end of the year. So whether that's effective January first or whenever, this is we do. Currently, the code would be need to be restructured for us to do that because the way the code reads right now is that after the council approves the um, cash and loot fee, it changes ten mm -hmm. days later, right? It's immediate because it's a resolution, but that. Okay. Yeah, we, we to affect this, we'd have to change the code to basically instead of a quarterly review, we'd do, we'd do a set June, July, and then and with effect an effective date of the first. January. Yeah. yeah, that's that's that part's pretty easy. Or but or you retrofit whatever we decide into the current code, <laughs> right? So in other words, like you know, it's not. Some percentage per month or something. We we just decide. You know, we just implement the change every quarter or every year or whatever. So, oh, but I, or we make no changes for three of the quarters and we make one change for. I, I like the year. idea of one change the first of the year to start heading towards that direction. I, so, you're all right with that? We we'll just leave it leave it alone for right now and. Hopefully. Wes, you can dig out some information. We'll, get some, we'll pound some heads, Wes. So we're getting tired of I think of one of the things you can also do is they can, they can be built into the uh, recommendation that it becomes effective at a date certain. So you can take a, a resolution in Jan or July that says this is the new cash and loop and it shall be effective January 1st, 2025. Yeah. That's something that can be done without a code change but the, if we know that that's what we're going to start doing then we additionally have to do a code change which is an ordinance and that process takes three to six months it's oh, part sure. of our process yeah. Yeah. ordinances aren't quick yeah. so there's there's some things i think that are available to your disposal now and then there's some other things as we're you guys are working through them that we can use to set forth what it'll look like in the future okay. did we come to a decision yeah, well, right now. Right. Not, not, to, not today. Right. <laughs> not not today. Time. But maybe maybe we keep with our quarterly review for this year. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to totally change the code. Yeah. yeah. And it's perfectly fine to not have change. And, and we would welcome a change if you guys have the data because I right. yeah, don't want to undercharge. Yeah, we'll have the data this summer. I can say okay. that. Do we need to vote on the no change? change? 
I don't think we need to no, do anything. Really an action on it, don't you? Yeah. 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 What do you accomplish? Not, not Just too much, but work is coming. Solidify the quarterly review list. Okay. The one thing but, I might ask, though, is as we do this, um, all this conversation, I've really appreciated. And I think it's important to, to capture what's being said. So our, our minutes are pretty action oriented, action minutes. General discussion followed about da da da. But for somebody that's reading it on the outside, may not fully pun intended appreciate what was being discussed. The memo that Renee sent out is great that we can include. I think the more, in my mind, to, I would offer that the board consider giving us some direction of what you would like us to see in terms of capturing what's being discussed. So it's not just, it was generally discussed, and here's the answer. I feel like it might be helpful for everyone to hear that these conversation points, now whether that's a more robust minutes or maybe it's we try to take what we heard and put it back into a, um, a water board communication for next year, for next year, for next month, for you guys to understand that there's been a lot talked about here. And then would, I feel like we might do a disservice if we just say, well, we talked about it. I feel like it would be more helpful to get, get it somehow captured. In the council communication where you've got what the cash would have been over the years since 1965. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to include maybe what the value for CBT is over the same time so people can see that this isn't a necessarily a huge jump versus CBT? And I think somebody mentioned, you know, to show the population growth, just to show that this isn't unreasonable or what's gone on over time is not unre unreasonable and they have things to compare to. I mean, you could pick out a, you know, a loaf of bread what it cost in 1965, and, you know, any of those things, but, you know, maybe have cost comparisons for a share of CBD over time and whether, and again, it's, you know, I think your time is valuable too. The cash in lieu up until, you know, from the beginning up till, uh, 20, I don't know, it tracks it's going to track really close because yeah. that's what it was based that's on. Was based on. Was right, and then, the, you know, an asterisk in that year where it changed, the way yeah. get booted, and now we're looking at something right. different. Yeah, absolutely. The general public will start to, oh, okay, I get it now. Yeah. Well, to your point, Wes, are you looking for something from us more than what I was looking for just to, if you want to have a conversation, maybe a general direction. Yes, yeah, so you don't direct us, possible. but you could at least give a suggestion to say that is important to capture what's being discussed. Because I hate to go through six months of discussion yeah. only to have the end no. result. That discussion, granted, people can go back and watch the video. That's that's no. that's one way of capturing that we didn't have before. But the written the written discussion, I think, is is good to have too. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> just to reframe that, I mean, I think we've all been in meetings, right, where like. You have a meeting and then the next month you have the same damn meeting and you're like, why am I yeah. in this meeting again, yeah. right? Yeah. Because the exact same things were just rehashed over and over. Yeah. And so just kind of a, a general, I, mean, I think you know, if you can do that, I think we agree with what you're saying. Okay. If you want to put a little more meat in it, I think that's fine. All right, well, we'll, we'll see if the, I don't have the, I'm not necessarily saying this is the way it should be, but I, I it, I'll have to talk with Heather too. I mean, I just didn't even have a conversation with her. I don't know whether the minutes are best to stay action, and then if they are, it might be that in our in our next water board write up, we try to recapture the major tenets of what were discussed here, and then you guys could reaffirm yeah, that. So yeah. we have some kind of <laughs> yeah. I see Chris and I say that's my preference too, Wes. I prefer not to have the minutes try to yeah. determine what was said and what was intended to be said yeah. 30 days later. Yeah, and you don't want 45 pages of minutes either that's just verbatim. That's probably not, I mean, that may not be overly helpful. Well, I think it's incumbent upon all of us, right, to like some point in the next 48 hours or something, write down almost kind of like the proposal or something for your, like based on the immediate, the immediate discussion that we've had here today, like what's, what what's I mean proposal is maybe but like some kind of like hey here's what I'm thinking you know like about this issue and then that's what you kind of like 
refresh yourself on when you come for the next meeting, and then we hit the ground running pretty well, right? Go. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I never know. Uh, I took pretty good me minute, minute, minute meetings, meeting minutes. So I will report them to our staff. We'll go over them. Ross and I can we'll look at them. Yeah, but nice. if you guys want to give us like a blurb of, well, you already wrote a memo, so that that something like that. No, bring it on. Bring it, the more that's information. That's part of the public it. record at this point, though. That's been distributed, and that's part of our record. Sure. So that's different than the minutes. It's attached to. Yeah. The minutes capture the synopsis of what was said, not word by word, by any stretch, in my opinion. Exactly. Yeah. So I've got notes on what I've gleaned. I'll run it by the team. We'll put together a statement, and maybe we can send it to you guys. I don't know how it works. Yeah. And you guys can be like, yeah. no, you misunderstood me completely, which is well, you, can, you can get a stab at what we read on the timing thing. I think yeah. you kind of get the sense of we want some regularity. Everybody wants some regularity. Yeah. And we've been, I think we've been looking at it too often and I, I know so, Hope does a great job, but she, you thought that Hope, but she does do a great job doing just what she said, capturing those minutes. It wouldn't be in the form of an email. We wouldn't want to have a meeting by distributing the board next water board, but we could at least have them, I think, available yeah. to what we what we heard for the next the next meeting, and then we can maybe get into issue number three or issue number four. <laughs> 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 it's going to take us a while. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. we all can yeah. appreciate. There's a lot of things that are probably worthy of discussion, yeah. and they're not quick answers. Not some of them might be quick answers, but if we're really thoughtful about, they're probably not. Or yeah. Well, thank you, Hope. But. I guess this will be continued next month. It will, yes. All right. If that's okay. And I, um, f yeah, I'm fine to plow through some more. No problem in waiting till next month. But then, you know, this is a six or eight month conversation. Yeah. We've got to get a lot of information. And so, yeah. It's good discussion. Yeah. Would a workshop be an appropriate format, too? I don't know my public meeting format. Type um, we, can, we can do workshop. I'm yeah, not we saying we have workshop. to. I'm just mm -hmm. something that can maybe let us speak freely, but also get. I'll be real honest, there, there's so much background we got to get in so much stuff. Yeah. I don't think we can, we'll be lucky to get it every month. <laughs> so that's. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I am future board. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything in here that we need to discuss any further. Yeah. Um, Anybody got any? Just one, one quick thing on the items for board, um, just to remind. Uh, the board. Uh, we have the National Guard training it was on every year up at Dunrock. It was last week, this week, and next week. And so um, they do their fire training. Uh, with their, uh, uh, they train firefighters how to, how to work with uh, uh, the aerial drops. And so they're pulling, they're using both Apache and Large helicopters of the So, anybody wants to go and for that, a trip there? Is there a yeah. helicopter? You get a ride? You don't get a ride. Oh, no. I <laughs> jump in the dump, dipping bucket. You get a ride. Yeah, you get Wednesdays and Thursdays. So, it's this Wednesday and this Thursday, and next Wednesday and next Thursday. So, um, I'm not sure they'll fly this week because of the weather. In fact, I'm almost sure they won't. But they will, if the weather's good, they'll fly next Wednesday. If you want to just go up for a short hike and, yeah. and take a, a view of them, or if you, if you want a trip up there, we'd be happy to drive okay. up there um, and watch them. But it's pretty fascinating to watch them work. Right. Um, Anything else? We're adjourned. Oh, just real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Stand with our St. Brain is looking to do an open space sales tax extension in November. They would, they're trying to, well, they would like to come to the water board to get a, a, a nod of support for that, as well as the Parks and Rec Advisory Board, as well as the State Building Board. Just an extension, you say? Yeah, it would be, well, what they're looking for is, if you're familiar with the transportation tax, is to make it a permanent tax as it exists now. Mm -hmm. So they would like to come to the board, 
do a brief presentation, and again, I know that they mentioned that they would like to get a letter of support for the extension. So if we could figure out a way to get that group in here to do that, I guess they could do it. It'd probably be better for the board, I would think, to have it scheduled rather than them to pop in and do their thing. But yeah. you want to work that through, Ken? Yeah, certainly can. Appreciate that. Yeah, just get it again, get us well, anybody against it? I do know that they've changed the language of the open space sales tax to incorporate more forest health and water repairing enhancement and preservation. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah, we'll schedule it. Okay. This would Sorry. be an informational meeting, right? right? Pardon me? This would be informational. Again, I think what they want, because at some point in time, they're going to go to council to make sure to try to get it on a November ballot. Yeah, so would they be looking for us to recommend something to council? I, yeah, probably, or you know, like a statement of that you would support the extension and what that might be. And again, we're going to be doing that with the Parks and Rec Advisory Board as well as the Sustainability yeah. Board. Yeah. We can put those options on. Okay. All right. All right. Anything else? Anybody? We're adjourned.